name is Beth fenster -Monfer. I'm the city's assistant city planner, and I work with the tree committee and the conservation commission. Um, so this was, the tree committee was just recreated this past December, and they're trying to raise awareness with residents in the city about the importance of trees and trying to help people care for trees or help them find programs to pay for trees um, and support the city planting more trees within the city. So uh, tonight is sort of one of our first walk workshops. We hope to have more in the future. Uh, April is our big tree month. Last week we had a tree issue in the Insider, um, did a presentation to council Monday night. We have tonight and then next week we're doing tree planting with uh, five trees with the students at Abadani Elementary School. So really getting out there and trying to get more stuff done. So the stars of the show tonight, um, we have from our community foresters from the state of New Hampshire have generously donated a tree that will be part of the presentation tonight. Um, the first half, we're going to go outside, so keep your jackets on um, and talk about proper planting techniques. And are we doing pruning outside as well? Just, no. we'll Just planting outside. Um, so Corey Keefe and AJ Dupree from the state will be doing that for you tonight. So um, I don't know if we want to do anything else or if we just want to pack up and head outside. We're going to head right outside because, as we know, it's going to get dark pretty quick. Uh, so everybody can stretch your legs, come on out back. We're going to go right back out here and look at one of the trees that's already in the ground. So as Beth mentioned, my name is A.J. Dupree. I'm the Urban Forester for the Division of Forest Lands. Part of our work uh, that Corey and I do is go around and help out communities, uh, dealing with trees, planting trees, putting the right tree in the right spot. And part of our mission with this is to get to the trees back in the urban area. Um, it's a tough environment, usually. It's been you know, filled in, compacted in. Beth was telling me they did some demo work around here, around the building and everything else. So it's not a nice, happy spot out in the forest for growing a tree. So selecting the right tree to fit in that environment uh, based on what you have for problems, overhead power lines, maybe some students, maybe some salt damage coming off a parking lot, that kind of stuff. So sec selecting the right species is key. Uh, and then obviously planting the tree uh, in this location and trying to get the best fit out of it possible that you can uh, helps out. So this tree would have arrived at the nursery uh, in a cage, um, so it would have had this wire basket all the way formed down around the bottom of it. Inside that wire basket would have been the burlap. Some of it's natural burlap, some of it's synthetic burlap. Some of the natural burlap even has uh, some material sometimes sprayed on it and everything else. So in my opinion, and a lot of opinion of a lot of other arborists and stuff like that, sometimes they'll disagree on this, but I want all that stuff off of the tree before it goes in the hole. If a tree shows up in a plastic pot, it just sort of makes sense to take that plastic pot off and you know, recycle the pot or reuse it for something else, well, that's just a pot. Some folks will have you take the top of the burlap off. Some, some magazines and that kind of stuff in di different literature will talk about taking part of the basket apart. And eventually that will rot and will decompose in the soil, provided that it's not synthetic burlap. And it's really tough to see. This is natural burlap. Some of it's already ripping. Some of it's already tearing. The synthetic stuff is a little more rough, and it's a little more sort of green and plasticky feeling. Um, but I want all that material out of there. And that takes a little bit of time. Uh, so the tree crew uh, came in earlier today, they dug a good sized hole, they had marked everything off for dig safe, that's what the white paint's on the ground, just in case there's all kinds of mysteries buried, you never know, even in your own front yard, uh, still call up for dig safe. Uh, reach out to the city and that kind of stuff because you never, you never know what's out there. Um, so that's what the white paint is on the ground, so they selected this location away from the path, away from the other trees, give everything some space, dug a nice big hole for this, and when we look at this tree, you know there's a ball down the bottom of that. It's about the size of a beach ball, and it's going to weigh several hundred pounds. And the size of that ball is based on the caliper of this tree. So the caliper of the tree is measured way down here. Everybody come up nice and close, and you'll be able to see what's going on. I'm going to unmulch this a little bit. So just regular natural wood chips. Uh, if you're going to put any kind of mulch on it, that kind of stuff, know where your mulch comes from. The mulch helps to keep the weed whacker guys away, so you don't get damage around the base of the trunk. Uh, helps to keep some water and moisture in the ground and it helps to show this tree off a little bit. So hopefully the next people aren't ripping up all the mulch all the time when they go looking at trees like this. But that bottom of that tree, the two and a half inch caliper is measured right down here about six inches above that swell at the bottom. And you can see it's still pretty shaky right now. So there's just a big blob of soil down there with all the roots encased in it. When they took that burlap off, took the wire basket off, you know, you could wrestle it around a little bit, put the tree down the ground, try to orient it nice and straight. Um, if it has any broken branches or whatever else, you take the broken branches off at this time. Uh, but if you selected a good tree and you transported it carefully all the way here, uh, it shouldn't have any damage. So we're not going to do any more pruning to this tree uh, at this time. Corey will talk about some of the pruning that you could do to other trees. And we, as we go in, we'll look at some of the trees that have already been in the ground. So there's a little flare right at the bottom of this tree. And that's on every tree all the way around here. 
Mother Nature knows where to put those trees in. The seed goes in the ground, comes out, and has a taper and a flare. So if you look at those big pines over there, they all have that bottom flare to the bottom of those trees. They're not just a pole sticking up out of the ground. So that's really key to get that right at that ground level and get that right at that natural height. So the hole with this was, you know, two to three times as wide as that ball, so they loosened up all the soil out in here. And the soil depth for that, you really sort of, you gotta pry that ball open and sort of measure the depth of that because you want the tree planted down on good, hard, firm ground. You don't want to over dig the depth of the hole. So that's why I encourage folks to dig the hole with a shovel uh, rather than a big backhoe or a big power tool because you're going to get tired digging with a shovel and you're going to stop digging at the right depth at some point because you've got to check it a few times. So they put the tree in the ground. Uh, they put a little gator bag on it. There's a bunch of different ways to water trees. This is about one of the simplest ways to do it. There's a bunch of different manufacturers. This is just a leaky trash bag. Um, it's got some little holes in the bottom of it, zips right up, up around the bottom of the tree, and it makes this tree stick out. So anybody that's helping out doing maintenance, whether it's a you know, watering crew or some, maybe some volunteers, whatever else, they can see this bag at the bottom of the tree and that remembers to, reminds them to fill that bag back up and fill it up with water. And it slowly leaks down to the bottom. You don't have to have one of these bags. You can just have a you know, leaky garden hose. Um, put it on that tree and give it several gallons of water every few days, especially if we get in the heat of summer. I'd like to see this tree watered you know, into late August. And you just fill that bag up every few days, check it, see how, see how fast that water is naturally being absorbed down to the bottom of the tree. Questions about the planting and sort of the mysteries of planting and the whys and all that kind of stuff. How the nurseries carry those? Uh, just about every nursery has them. You can get them on you know, the WW, you know, anywhere. Nurseries will have them. You can buy them off the web. Um, we buy a lot of our trees you know, from wholesale nurseries, uh, but uh, you, know, you can buy these bags and that kind of stuff. They'll have different brands. Um, this one just happens to be the Gator one. And uh, sometimes you can get them. They look like a little uh, brown donut, so they hide down in the mulch. Uh, so it's a little bit more pleasing, but I want this to stick out because I'm not going to come back and water this. Somebody else is going to have to water that. So I want this tree to look like it's a little different than the rest. Because those trees over there have been in the ground for you know, two or three years maybe. Um, just one year? Yep. yep. So those have been you know, absorbed in the ground. Hopefully they're going to still get some water if we get into drought this year. Uh, the trees all around this edge, I mean these have been here for years. Uh, so they've sort of matched their root system to how much water is available and all those kind of things. Yep, I want you know I want the mulch all in this area, and I don't want it piled up against the side of the tree like this. So I just want it pulled back just off the bottom of the tree, and I want to make a little ring out of it. So I open it up just so you could see that flare in there. And when you're done, you're going to have two or three inches of mulch spread out. And I'd like the mulch ring as big as reasonably possible, at least out to the drip line of the tree, because again, that keeps the weed whackers away, the lawnmowers away, everything else, and just gives this tree some space. You tr try to avoid that volcano mulch. You'll see it a lot of times at commercial properties. They just, you know, they just keep piling that red mulch back up on the side of the tree. They don't have any weeds, uh, and that eliminates all the weeds. But the problem is that tree trunk itself will stay wet, and eventually that can cause some rot and some dieback on the sides of the tree. That was a great question. What kind of trees? You tell me. <laughs> any guesses? Alder. No. Maple. No. This is, this is a foreign tree for around this area, so it's not a native tree, it's a parodia. So it's in the witch hazel family. So this wants to be a small tree, 30 maybe, 40 feet tall max if it's really happy. Uh, it's going to be really a relatively upright form, so it's a good tree to stick in maybe some small spots that you might have. Um, I don't know what the future use of this spot is and that kind of stuff. I know they put in some maples over there so it'll fill up against the side of the building. Um, so you can get the right tree for the right spot to get in that area. Uh, I'll have beautiful fall foliage on this tree. Won't be as good as sugar maple, but it's really close. Yep. Why do you use native trees? What's that? Why do you use native trees? Uh, some people use uh, native trees only. Some people use a balance between the both. Uh, this tree is perfect for a real tough and urban environment. Uh, some of our native trees won't take well to a real tough and urban environment. And by that I mean high drought, high salt you know, issues. Um, some trees will. So, you know, there's a pin oak right back here. Great native tree, really tough tree, takes to a lot of urban pressures and everything else, but that tree is going to use a lot of space. It's going to have real low hanging branches. So a good variety and a good mix uh, helps out as well. So you want to keep it smaller too? Uh, with this particular tree, I'm not sure why they selected this one for this location, if there's other stuff going on around this property, but this tree will naturally be a smaller tree. Yeah. It's probably going to reach out 25, maybe 30 feet. 40 feet is about max for these. Uh, and this is going to be a little bit of a vase-shaped tree, so it's a little bit more upright. 
and it's and it's you know it's talking to the other landowners and other sort of people invested on this property and, and what they want to do with the grounds around here of how much space they can give up for this tree. I would fill this whole field in with a lot, all kinds of stuff, but all the ball players and everybody else would like you know space to play ball, and so there's a balance with all those kind of things. When, yep. Compost, fertilizer, or anything to this soil? I wasn't the one that planted this. I would not add anything to back into that soil as long as I found decent material coming out of it. And you can tell that just by you know reaching down to the soil that was in this hole. Um, so it's a sandy, silty loam, has organic matter in it. Sometimes we get into trees and we're planting you know right downtown, and we're into urban rubble, and you find concrete and bricks and everything else. So I take that stuff out. If I'm going to put soil back in there to amend that, I would never do more than a 50-50 mix of good loam back into that with compost mixed it into it uh, because I don't want the tree to grow in a bathtub. I want those roots to toughen up and eventually grow out into that sandy, gravelly, you know, rubble that's out there. And I would select the right tree to fit into that area. So ideal situation with proper planting in this, I would go see the site ahead of time, work with towns to fix, fix those sites out try to stay away from power lines and you know, sidewalks and all the other conflicts that we have with those issues and get the right tree back in there and pull a soil test. Um, so you know, in, a, in a perfect world, this would have you know, started six, eight months ago. Uh, find the site, find the location, everything else. And, and this may have been on Ryan's list for a while. Um, he's going to be planting trees I mean, all over the city. And so there's, there's a bigger picture with why this tree and why this species at this location. And for your home yards, uh, Corey will talk about uh, some of the programs online tonight. Uh, that will help you select the right trees to get the most energy benefits out of it and other you know aspects whether you want fall foliage whether you want to bring birds in your yard and that kind of stuff there's trees there's ways that you can select certain habitats and certain benefits of trees that you want to have any other questions yep yeah. yeah. sure shoot when you dig this hole i mean should you go a lot deeper than the root ball no i don't want to go any deeper than the root ball remember we talked about digging it by hand yeah. rather than digging with a backhoe I'm suspecting they had planned on some frost in this ground because we're just barely into spring. <laughs> I was over at, uh, in the uh, western part of the state, so there's some big tracks right here. So I'm assuming, Corey, were they here with the backhoe, do you know? Yeah. yeah. So they probably opened up the hole with a backhoe, but I'm hoping they finish it off by hand because I want you to dig just as deep as that root ball. I want you to find the flare, open the tree up on the ground over here, open it up completely, measure down from there down to the bottom of that and just put that tree in because I don't want it on loose soil because that's going to want to come back down and eventually that tree could fall down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll see trees in urban areas where they're you know, two or three inches lower than they should be, and that tree could have just, just by the weight of the tree in time, sunk down in that hole as that soil compacts. When I backfill in a tree like this, I'm going to want to make mud. I'm going to want to just pour water in there. By pouring the water in there, as that water dissolves down into the soil, it's going to pull soil down in it, and it's going to fill in all those air pockets. The tricks used to be, when I was in first in college, was just go around and just jump up and down on it, stomp it as hard as you possibly could but we know that you're going to break some roots doing that. So I'd rather make a huge mud pit um, and just pull the water down in that soil and that water pulls that soil down with it and fills in all those air gaps. That's just a little different way of planting some of those trees over the years. Yep, a couple more questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, you right over here. Um, getting back to the previous question on um, what goes back in the hole, um, a lot of the heights area is mostly sand, yep. like, like my yard is. Um. So I'd want to select a tree this one's going to take to drought related issues. So I'd want to take a tree that is going to take to drought or know that you're going to be good to your tree and water it during the drought time frames. So there's a lot of trees around here, all the pitch pines and everything else take to drought without a problem. So there's, there's benefits to that, but also you're limiting the trees that are going to be growing and they're happy naturally by themselves. You can put any species in sand, but you're going to have to water it when it needs it. So sugar maples want well-drained soil, but they also want really rich soil. So a sand environment's not great for them, so they're never going to be perfectly happy. Um, you can push it and put more compost in that soil, put more mulch on this ground, put more compost to it over time, but it's better to get the right tree for that spot uh, so you're not always pushing, pushing up against the hill. Yeah. Yep. Are you going to have to brace that to keep it going straight? Uh, all depends on how severe the wind is around in here. Yeah. So as far as, you know, those trees over there were staked and I would assume this one's going to get staked as well. The wind coming around urban buildings and that kind of stuff can be tough to the trees. So, you know, right now it's not too bad. And in most situations, I wouldn't stake trees. Uh, unfortunately, those stakes usually turn into swords and everything else for kids to play with and, and get forgotten. Um, so in a lot of urban areas and stuff like that, I wouldn't stake them. But Ryan would know better whether, whether this area gets a lot of wind. I don't know. Looking at you, Beth. This is your town. <laughs> my, off, my office is down on the seacoast. And we get, you know, we get stormy weather and that kind of stuff all over the state. 
but really sort of knowing, you know, if this height of land is, is catching more of the winds, and, you know, those have all been staked. If they've been in the ground for the year, I want those stakes coming off, and that tree has got to adjust and find its own balance uh, with yeah, the wind. Those other trees, is that going to lean out this way, or do you think? Or uh, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't have a problem leaning out this way. When a tree, uh, you know, sort of goes to that southern exposure and draws itself to the sun, the tree is actually growing more on the back side. Uh, the tree actually wants to grow up and, and take over its space uh, as much as it can. So as long as it has enough space, and this is plenty of distance from those trees, because you know that ash over there and that kind of stuff isn't going to cause a problem for this tree. Uh, and then this is actually a really good spot to, you know, it's far enough away so you're not fighting for that competition for that sunlight. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Well. Uh, I wouldn't do any root pruning unless I have some girdling roots on the bottom of that. Uh, occasionally when these trees are dug up, you know, this was dug up with a mechanical scoop, like a big ice cream scoop in the front of a tractor. Uh, they just, you know, dug out a ball of soil with it. Sometimes it's dug out with a tree spade. So the only thing I would look for when I open that up is any roots that's really sort of tur turning back on itself, and that's known as a girdling root. And you find that when you open that up. Everybody's potted a plant, transplanted a house plant that you should have done a couple of mo months ago, and by the time you pull it up, it looks like a whole big ball of spaghetti. Um, so you open those roots up and you open those things up. Used to be an idea years ago to cut all those roots and open them all up. Uh, but I physically just want to sort of tease them all open and just open all those roots up and just keep it as wet as you possibly can to, to try to keep those roots from drying out. Planting early in the spring reduces the stress on the trees as well uh, because this tree really isn't awake yet. It's not, it's just thinking spring's coming. Uh, much tougher on a tree to put it in with full leaves on, you know, in the middle of July during, you know, the hot sunny days and stuff like that. Like sizes of trees, like if you ordered a tree online and it was just a little bit because yep. for homeowners it's probably easier. I mean, this is going to be very difficult for a homeowner to plant this size. Yeah, you know, this tree on the wholesale end is you know a few hundred bucks and it's a few hundred pounds, yeah. so it's you and a few of your buddies to you know, this isn't fitting in the back of the minivan well. So, this was you know, was shipped on a truck, it was wrapped up in a, in a hopefully in a you know, good cloth tarp to protect this from, from the wind, from you know, getting brushed it you know, by the wind and that kind of stuff that got shipped over here. So this is, you know, this is a few people helping out with this, uh, or you know, mechanical machinery and that kind of stuff. So the smaller tree that you purchase, uh, whether it's in a pot, a lot of times the one-inch caliper trees and that kind of stuff, and smaller will come in a pot. Just, again, take the pot off, open all that soil up and that kind of stuff, and get those tree roots and try to help spread them out as best you can. The smaller trees will actually take over and adapt into a hole pretty quickly, and they'll actually catch up to the big trees pretty quick, uh, provided that they're you know, in a decent soil. It doesn't have to be great, just has to be decent soil. Uh, and that you stay on top of the watering. Watering is critical for the first year because the, all the absorption of all the water and the roots and everything else is those fine little hair roots that are in there that you sort of mash and sort of bang, you know, to stick into a pot. So spreading them out and keeping them moist. And a tree like this, I'd wanna, you know, I'd wanna see this thing get, you know, 10, 12 gallons of water a week if you could. Um, you can get different size bags. Uh, the advantage with the gated bags, you can come quick and fill it and then slowly that water leaches back down into the soil. Uh, a leaky garden hose does the same thing five gallon pail with a hole drilled into it. If you can just, you know, everybody's got a cracked five gallon pail somewhere in their basement. You just put that here and let that water slowly leak down because the water's going to go low down into the ground rather than just running on off and getting eaten up by the grass. Anything else? Okay, perfect. Let's look at these other trees on our way in. So when this tree arrived, it was covered in soil all the way up to here. So that root ball Naturally, that digging process just forms more roots and puts more soil up on top of that root ball. So the top of that root ball was opened up and they planted it right down at that right depth, right where that swell is, right at ground level. So it's a nice looking tree, nice middle, little maple tree, uh, staked, a couple of stakes with a tree chain on it. Uh, so this is uh, either fabric material or plastic material. And every time I see these, I just always move them. And you just move that into a new location every time, so it's never going to do any damage to that bark. Is that moss going to hurt it at all? Or? No, um, that's all lichen grown on the side of that tree. So wherever that tree was before it got here, uh, was probably planted in a really tight, close nursery bed. Uh, and that's growing as a result of moisture on the side of that bark. And over time, that sun and the, and the you know, is going to cook it right off the side of that bark. Is it time to prune that tree at all? Um, I wouldn't... Looking at the leader, it looks like there's some bark damage. It could be some damage up around the top of that. The only thing I'd want to do, there was probably a branch pruned, possibly pruned out of that, or maybe that top branch got some damage to it. Um, you know, step ladder, bring it out, and come up and prune it. The only thing I'd want to do is uh, try to remove competing leaders. So I wouldn't do any pruning on that tree unless, you know, somebody broke a branch or something like that, and I'd wait at least a year or two, and then come back, and that, you know, maybe time for that branch to, uh, you know, come up out of there. But I'd want to get a little closer look at it, then we can see all the way down here. 
And what you're trying to do is just try to get back to a central leader on that tree to give it some space and to have one leader be out of it. And then it naturally forms those lateral branches that come out and make this big full crown. And this tree is going to want to be 30 or 40 feet wide once, it's, once it grows up. Plenty of space back from the, you know, from the sidewalk and everything else, good distance away, still back away from the field so they can still have full field access. So there's that balance between all the competing interests for this space. Any other questions? Yep. How much will a tree like that grow in a year? Uh, the first year, it's not going to grow hardly at all. Uh, plants go through a period of transplant shock. So the first year that that tree's in over there, it's just going to sit and hang out. Next year, it's going to grow a couple of inches. Once this one's in two or three, inch, two or three years into this ground, you're going to start to see the new growth. This one, you know, grow three or four inches. You can see those little red stems growing up. This one will put on six to eight inches of growth in a year. And it'll keep that up and it'll keep multiplying that growth as it goes along. Uh, all the maples grow relatively fast. It's not the fastest growing tree out there, but it's pretty fast. Any other questions? Okay, let's head inside. All those trees have been root proofed in the nursery. They go along with you know, a big disc uh, and they're cutting the roots off to try to make them fit into that small package. Because those roots on that tree were probably six or eight feet long and they just they can't ship that much soil with it. Nobody's going to be able to pick it up. Um, so they form those roots into a, into a smaller sort of compact farm. So you can dig trees in the yard, but be realistic. Um, you know, a couple cubic feet of soil, you lift in, you know, a few hundred pounds to have the tender done. So a couple of buddies, um, or you can bear roots of trees. You can just physically dig it up on the ground, you know, on a good cloudy rainy day and take that tree out with no soil and just take the roots out of the ground. Will that uh, hurt the tree cutting the roots? Uh, it won't hurt the tree so much. It will stimulate it to grow some new roots up close to it. Uh, it's not, it's not going to be fond of you for a little while. Um, it's going to lose some leaves. Some of those leaves will discolor a little bit. But by cutting those roots back, you're not going to get them all, but you're going to cut some of them so they will stimulate new root growth closer up to the tree. Good question. Yeah, what if you've got like a lilac? I'm trying to get the shoots and transplant them. Sure. We're about Lilacs are kind of a bugger. Yeah. You can go out there tomorrow and just jump on that shovel and just take a shovel full with you. Yeah, uh, and just water the daylight out of it. Okay. Uh, much smaller plant, much less need for nutrients and water and space and everything else. I mean, you just cut the plant right in half with the shovel. Uh, ideal situation is sharpen the shovel up first. Take a grinder, put a good edge to it, and just, just pump, cut, cut it right off and pick a chunk with you. Uh, just because they're just tough. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'll be here for the rest of the night, but Corey's taking over. So if you got more questions, I'll be around. So as Beth mentioned, I'm Corey Key from the Community Forester for the Division of Forest and Lands. Um, today I'm going to be talking primarily about pruning, uh, but I am going to touch on a program called iTree Design. Has anybody heard of iTree before? Um, what it is is a free web-based program that allows anyone to make an easy estimate of the benefits that trees provide. Um, it's peer-reviewed by the USDA Forest Service. All you do, and if AJ, you could hand out the piece of paper that has a link. At the top of the page that you're going to get, there's a link to this, uh, to iTree. And it sends you to this link, and you just type in your address, and it'll, take, it'll show a map of your house. And what you do is, after that, um, you draw a little polygon feature around the structure, which would be your house, and then you input a tree. And when you input a tree, you get to see this color-coded map up here, and it tells you which, which side of the house is the most beneficial to plant. The dark green is more beneficial, the yellow is uh, less beneficial. Um, the reason why you draw a polygon around this, the structure, it shows your heating and cooling costs, how they've been reduced when you plant the tree. It also quantifies uh, stormwater runoff and some greenhouse gas mitigation, um, and that's about it. But it's a great program if you decide to plant a tree and you're wondering where the best place to plant it is. You just use this program. My dad, who's not tech savvy at all, I showed him this, and he was, could use this pretty easily. So it's very user friendly. Um, does anyone have any questions on this iTree program? Because I'm going to go into tree pruning. Yes? I assume that the, the uh, dark green, light green, yada, 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 yellow uh, is uh, based on the the sun and where the sun is and it does it asks a bunch of questions and then it constructs that to be the right shades for you to put your trees in. Is that Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of times and so on. Then up at the top is where the dark green is. That's the northern part of this property. I think this is done, this example is in Plymouth, uh, Plymouth University. 
and a lot of times you can reduce your heating costs planting on the northern side, especially using conifers because it blocks those northern winds coming in. So side of the house is really beneficial to plant. Yep. Is this limited to any specific geographic locations or? Every, I've tried multiple different addresses in New Hampshire and they've worked, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not 100% sure on that. So you put in your tab, you select a species, and you have to go through each one. Oh. Um, and you, give you a printout. Yeah, it, it won't. This area I like. And I, exactly. If you, you'd have to try an oak and see where the best place to plant it, and then if it, you know, maybe try a smaller tree after. So you have to go through each tree, um, to my knowledge. But it's a, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a super easy program, and it's just, I didn't know anything about it until I started working here. Now, you know, I'm certainly going to use this as much as I can. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about structural pruning of young and medium age landscape trees. What pruning is, is just a selective removal of plant parts to achieve an objective. That's all it is. Um, that being said, you can do a lot of damage to the tree if you prune improperly. Um, however, there's also a lot of consequences if you don't prune the tree. Um, so, but the biggest thing is just defining what your objective is. And some objectives that I'm gonna go over are one of them, probably the most important one, for, for me at least, is managing risk. What is risk? Um, it's just the level of um, chance that a tree could fail and cause consequences. And it depends on the severity of the consequences. So, how I would manage risk if I get asked to go look at a mature tree and I saw dead branches, um, say the tree, the, the crown was 70% healthy, just had a couple of dead limbs overhanging a car, I would suggest a, a pruning method called cleaning the crown. And all that means you're removing dead, diseased, broken limbs. It's the type of pruning you can do any time of the year because you're just removing dead limbs. Another objective would be to manage health. And you can do this with cleaning the crown as well, because when you take out the dead limbs and the diseased limbs, you're eliminating, el eliminating the entry point for harmful insects and diseases to enter the tree. So that might be another objective of why you prune your tree. Yep? When you prune it, should you seal it with anything or just leave it exposed? Many years ago, that was suggested, but they actually don't recommend it at all anymore, because what happens is when you put paint on the tree, on the, the wounding, or on the wound, you can actually have the tissue start to curl in. It's called um, ram's horn, which I'll show you. Uh, get a couple slides of it. You can actually cause internal cracks on the inside of the tree. So it's not recommended at all. If any arborist suggests that, you know, I'd reconsider looking for another arborist. Um, another objective may be to provide clearance. Um, for me, on my property, I get a bunch of balsam firs and spruce trees uh, along the driveway, and I get a mow around them. Um, so I just got annoyed of getting uh, poked at by all the branches. So what I did is I did a pruning method called raising the crown. Raising the crown. Um, and all that is is removing the lower branches to provide vertical clearance. Um, you see this a lot of times in cities along the sidewalks. Usually they'll prune up roughly eight feet so people can walk underneath them. Um, the reason why I have that marked with one third. It's a best management practice not to remove more than one third of the canopy. Um, doing so, you can cause damage to the tree. Um, one thing you're also doing is you're, when you take off the branches on the lower part, if you go more than a third, you're gonna get reduced taper in the stem. And all taper is is just the difference in diameter from the top of the tree uh, to the bottom of the tree. Um, having branches on there, it's just like, it's almost like a muscle, make the stem, the diameter increase. Um, also, if you raise the crown too high, one thing you do is you put the center of gravity up higher in the tree, and um, obviously higher up in the tree you get higher wind velocities. So therefore you're more likely to put more mechanical stress on the stem of the tree. Um, I showed this slide here. A lot of times you get large branches, large aggressive branches um, at the bottom, and you can get so much weight towards them, you get what's called the dip or shear crack. On the top of that branch is uh, tension wood, and at the bottom is compression wood. And between that, you get that crack right there. So if I saw that, you know, I'd be achieving three objectives right there. Be, if I remove that, I'd you know, provide clearance, I'd increase the health of the tree, and I'd also reduce risk. 
Another objective would be to manage size or shape. Uh, a lot of times utility companies will do this when there's a wrongly planted tree underneath the wires, say a mature growing tree. They need to provide clearance to the utility conductors. So what they'll do is reduction pruning. And this is not the same as topping. Topping is an improper substandard pruning practice that no tree should experience um, in the urban environment. The difference between reduction pruning and topping is with reduction pruning, you're going back to a lateral branch that's at least a third the diameter or half the diameter in size. Um, if you were topping, you would not go back to a branch that's large enough and you're gonna kill the tree and just create a risk um, for the public. Another objective is to prove of, um, aesthetics. This is very subjective, so I'm not really gonna go into detail. Everyone has a different opinion on what looks good. Another objective maybe is to manage production of fruit or flowers. Right here, we prune this. This tree is um, a peach tree at Shilling Forest in Peterborough, New Hampshire. And we prune this one with an open center crown. And this is uh, to maximize fruit production. So it's also, we prune it so it stays low enough so that you can actually pick fruit from the branches. Um, also, it's maximizing sunlight from all directions so the fruit can uh, grow to its full potential. I would not prune this way for a large uh, mature tree. Another objective could be rejuvenation of shrubs. Right here is our state flower. This is the lilac. Um, one thing you can do is, as AJ mentioned, a very tough, tough tree. You cut them at the base and you get um, root suckers that will come up and rejuvenate. I'm not going to talk too much about pruning for flowers, but one thing you do with lilac trees is you want to prevent them. If you want them for flowers, you want to cut stems that are bigger than an inch in, or cut stems that are bigger than an inch and a half or two inches in diameter because they could get a lilac borer that bores into it. And also by cutting the big stems, you also keep the, the shrub low enough so you can keep the flowers at nose level so you can smell them. Um, Yes, if I want to maximize uh, the flower production. Yeah. If you want it for a tree and you want it taller, you know, you could certainly prune it a different way, but if you want it for flowers, that's typically the, the best way to do so. Another objective, manage wildlife habitat. Um, to accomplish this, I don't recommend this for any trees that are along the street or if there's a target present, like a house, a piece of property, anything like that, because what you're doing is you're essentially killing the tree. But what arborists are doing, um, seeing it out west, uh, in the United States, they're doing natural fracture pruning. And what that is, they basically climb up the tree, they take out the top of the tree, and then there's a flat surface left, and then they do what's coronet, it's called coronet cuts, and they make small little curve cuts at the top to produce an angle that just wildlife and um, some raptors prefer that kind of habitat. So that is an, ar an option that some arborists uh, present. And the last objective is develop structure. And this is going to be the main talk of tonight. So what is structural pruning? ANSI, which is the American National Standards Institute, which are the standards that arborists follow um, in the United States if you're a certified arborist, defines it as a structural pruning shall consist of selective pruning to improve tree and branch architecture primarily on young and medium aged trees. Removal of live branches and stems to influence the orientation, spacing, growth rate, strength, attachment, and ultimate size of branches. Basically what it is, is you're pruning to a central trunk or leader. And you're trying to prevent the other branches that grow along the trunk to grow bigger than half the diameter of the trunk. And I'm going to talk more about that. I'm going to explain how you would do that uh, and why you want to keep the branches half the diameter of the trunk. Um, this type of pruning is certainly not for fruit or flower production. The whole purpose of it is to increase the structure of the tree um, so it can withstand the mechanical stresses that are in the environment, such as wind, snow, ice, maybe just a heavy seed year. Um, and especially important in just New Hampshire, New England, we've had a lot of windstorms in the last couple of years and just we've had some funky weather the last couple of years. Um, primarily, it can be done on any age of the tree. It's best to do it on young and medium aged trees, especially young trees. It's just like anything, your car, your body, your dog. You train it when it's young, you're going to have less problems down the road. And this is typically what you're looking at um, when the tree is structurally pruned. Um, should you structurally prune all trees? 
For certain systems of pruning, you don't have to. There's some that are done in Europe called espalier, um, and then there's pollarding, there's pleaching, um, some other techniques done in Europe, which I'm not even going to get into today just because we don't use them. And if you're pruning for fruit or flower, then you wouldn't structurally prune the tree. But typically for most trees, they should be, I think they should be structurally pruned. It's more important for large mature trees that grow greater than 35 feet because they're higher up in the air. They're exposed to higher velocities of wind um, compared to a small tree, which just doesn't get that same kind of wind as a large growing uh, tall tree does. Also, um, there's also when those parts come down on the large tree, you know, these, there's large leaders that are coming down that it's going to cause a lot more property damage than your house, to your house than, you know, obviously a small growing tree. So right here, these are just some um, crab apple trees. These are trees that I would technically, I, I wouldn't structurally prune because I'm trying to maximize fruit production. Um, that's Mount Monadnock if anybody's questioning. Here's um, some of the lilacs. Again, I'd be pruning for flowers, so I'm not going to structurally prune these. This is the peach tree. This is for fruit production. So most likely not going to prune this. Why is it important to structurally prune trees when they're young? Well, you can save a lot of money and time if you prune this tree when it was young. Now, that's going to cost a lot of money. That tree needs, in my opinion, should come down. That's going to cost much more money. This is something that could have been avoided if that tree was pruned when it was young. Um, that large leaf that came off at the bottom, this was during a windstorm. There's included bark in there, which I'm going to talk more about. You also see some decay in the trunk. Even the other lead going up to the left, we call that a codominant stem. Uh, codominant stems are stems that are greater than half the diameter of the trunk. It snapped up there. What I love about this picture is if you were to ask me uh, before this windstorm took place which tree was going to fall, either this one or this dead tree, I think most people would have said this dead tree, but look, this is the one that came down and that dead tree is still standing. And that's partially due to this being this time of the year. There's leaves out there. It has a lot more drag in the wind. This one a lot of times during windstorms, you know those dead ones, they'll kind of just stand still. Not saying that they shouldn't come down, but during windstorms, a lot of times these are the ones that fail. Oops. Right here is a black birch. Same thing, failed right at the junction of the two stems. That could have been avoided if it was structurally pruned when this was young. And typically, when you plant a tree, they cost roughly more than 400 you know, bucks if you get a two-inch caliber tree. Now that whole tree should probably come down because that's a large wound. Right here as well, white pine. Didn't even have included bark, just a codominant stem snapped right there during a windstorm. This is a calorie pear. I see these planted in cities. Um, There's an urban, strong, tough tree. But the issue with them, they have all their branches come to one junction right there. And the trunk is unable to put wood over those branches. And you get an extremely um, weak connection here. It's a tree that's beautiful during the springtime. It's got white flowers for a week. And then after that causes nothing but issues. Tree, a lot of times, it will keep its leaves on later in the winter. So a lot of times, you got to apply more road salt along the sidewalks to keep uh, people from slipping. Right here is a white ash tree, pretty strong tree. Windstorm snapped right at the codominant lead right there. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure if everyone here is from Concord, I'm sure everyone here knows about the Emerald Ash Borer. Um, it's been you know, really impacting a lot of the ash trees around here. Um, on your piece of paper, I have a link called NewHampshireBugs.org that has tons of information on a lot of the forest pests that we have in New Hampshire. Um, that's brought on by, it's the USDA Forest Service, UNH Cooperative Extension, Division of Forest and Land, and APHIS that brings that on. It's a great site. I use it all the time. It shows a map of where the EAB is in the state and other forest pests. This is a Liberty Elm. Um, small, probably one to two inch caliber tree. Once again, snapped right at the junction. So, trees in a woodland environment, as you can see, they grow straight. The branches attached to them are smaller than half the diameter of the trunk. Um, even this, these are all pine, white pines here, but even this red maple right here. If you look at the branches, they're much smaller than the trunk, and that's exactly what we want. Trees have evolved in a, growing next to each other for millions of years. You know, they, they found out that when you grow this way, you're they can withstand more wind and mechanical stresses that are applied to them. Right here, some red pines. 
I will say this is one tree if you plant out in the open it's still going to grow straight but it was just a good picture of a, of a wood lot but you can see straight stem um, they're not getting sun from all the angles and they have to compete so they go they grow straight up um, that's what forces them to not develop a lot of large low growing species and they also self prune themselves right here red oak in a wood lot straight stem now in the open landscape this is the same species as that last picture red oak red oak look how different it's grown in the open landscape how trees grow are based on their genetics but also their environment around them um, so we see I see plenty of codon it's a gorgeous tree um, but a lot of weak structure involved with the, the branch attachment to the trunk I will say there's some trees like in the savannah or deserts that have grown in the open for thousands and millions of years but one difference is I think it's a hawthorn when they grow they put their branches they actually touch the ground so they can support the weight in the urban environment we can't let trees do that at all they obstruct us and we have to provide vertical clearance here's another one white pine grown in the open environment I believe this tree was planted um, see many stems I don't see any any included bark this most likely was caused by a white pine weevil which is a small little insect that feeds on the terminal lead that's why there was probably two shoots there or it was headed by the nursery and what they did heading they just top it so you get many sprouts um, I can tell you one thing AJ mentioned I can tell most likely this tree was planted because I think right here this is a girdling root which he was talking about I think either the cage or the burlap was left on this tree that's why this might have might have caused that or that tree was planted too deeply right here cat Sura, once again open environment tons of codominant stems on it very weak attachments to the trunk Japanese alcova see these planted all along the streets are a great urban tree but this thing should have been pruned when it was younger there's so many issues it's it, that would be hard to correct it's a little leaf linden right here which I'm going to go into more detail included bark which is even weaker than just codominant stems without it so as you guys can see there's a huge difference between trees growing in the forest setting versus an open landscape they grow completely different because the environment's different why is it crucial to keep branches less than half the diameter of the trunk right here this is a branch collar the swelling you see this um, a lot of times when smaller branches come to the trunk it's good um, how this is formed is the branches will at the beginning of the growing season the branch puts on tissue that overlaps the trunk later in the growing season the trunk puts on tissue that overlaps the branch and that happens year after year and you get this branch collar it's extremely strong it also has a natural protection zone on the inside of it called the um, branch protection zone and what it is is made up of cells and chemicals and it resists decay from getting inside the trunk right here this is a radial um, view this is the branch protection zone right here inside the tree so these stems right here as I mentioned codominant stems to the left You've got two leads about the same diameter a weak connection right here is a branch bark ridge which is bark protruding outwards and right here you have a codominant stem with included bark this is much weaker than this one right here um, all included bark is is you got two leads and they're basically they're almost two separate leads and they grow against and push against each other and bark just gets crushed and weaved between there um, and a lot of times when there's a windstorm usually when trees are blown in the wind they go back and forth codominant stems especially with the included bark will shear back and forth so that also leaves an injury sometimes inside the tree but there's no branch protection zone there so there's nothing to resist the, the decay from getting inside the trunk How could they have that? I will, I'll talk about that very shortly I love this image this was done by a study um, by Dr. Ed Gilman who's in Florida so I don't forget what the exact force that was applied to these stems but that small branch at the bottom took twice as much force to snap compared to that larger limb at that junction at top that shows how much stronger the union is when there's a small branch going to the trunk versus when there's two that are the same size so 
To structurally prune the tree, there's gonna be three cuts that you need to know. The first one is a removal cut. It used to be known as a thinning cut. And what that is, you make the cut right there back to the branch collar. And a removal cut, you're always removing the smaller limb back to a junction. This is making this cut is the best way to get to decrease the level of decay from getting inside the trunk. Another cut you're going to know, need to know, and you're going to use this probably primarily for doing structural pruning, is a reduction cut, where you take out the bigger, at a junction, you take out the bigger stem. And this is how you make it, because typically with the removal cut, you're going to make it at a branch collar. When you make a reduction cut, there is no branch collar. So what you do is you find the branch, uh, the bark ridge right here, and then you draw a line perpendicular, and then you want to bisect that angle. That's where the cut should be, at an angle. One thing this does, um, if you get water on it, it'll allow water to drain off, which is one of the ingredients for um, fungal pathogens. But it also mimics the branch, uh, branch protection zone, so it's the best way to seal up the wound, making the cut this way. The last cut I'm going to talk about for structural pruning is a heading cut. If there's any arborist in the room, they're going to be shaking their head. 99% of the time, this is an improper cut to make. However, this is a cut that you can make on branches that are less than two years old because it's all live tissue in there. There's no dead heartwood tissue in there, which I'll show you in, in a bit. So a head and cut, you're not going back to a lateral. You're going back what's called the internode, which is between two laterals. And the reason why you would do this, the only time you would do this is for young trees. And for a young planted tree, at the top of the stem, for example, you could have three leads coming out. If you took out the two leads back to the trunk, what you could do is that's, that's usually typically what's done, but the other stem in the middle is going to grow much taller and it could topple over. If you leave those two stems there and just reduce them in size, um, you're going to get more taper on that main stem so it won't topple over. But in most scenarios, that's a bad cut to make. So for large limbs, what we use is called the three cut method. The reason you do this is to prevent tearing down the trunk of the tree. First cut you make is right here at the yellow. The second cut you make is up top, downwards, about an inch from your undercut. Um, if, you have a, if you're using a chainsaw versus a handsaw, if you have a chainsaw, you want to make that second cut right on top of the first cut because your chainsaw will pinch because of the curve. But if you're just using a handsaw, this is the way you want to make it. And then you make your final cut right back as close as you can to either branch collar or the stem. This one has included bark, so there is no branch collar, so I want to go as close as I can without damaging that healthy lead to the left. Corey, yep. So after the second cut, has the, the, most of the branch fallen off? Yes. Okay. And that's why you do it. If you just make a cut right here for a large stem, what's going to happen is that bark's going to tear down the trunk and you're going to get a large wound. I even use for certain, I'm going to get into it, for certain seasons of the year when you're pruning, I'll even use this on small, smaller cuts. Sometimes the bark's a little juicier and it tears more. So I'm going to go over some improper cuts. Right here, I just made a flush cut. This is actually on AJ's property, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so what I did is I took off the whole branch collar, I took off the branch bark ridge right here, and I eliminated the whole branch prote protection zone on the inside. So now there's no decay is going to get right inside the trunk. Earlier in the talk, I mentioned heartwood. You see when you cut open a stem, you see it in pine a lot. It's this dark tissue here. That's old tissue, and it's actually dead. It doesn't conduct water at all. Um, the only thing it's for is to give the tree some internal support. But right here, the lighter color, that's sapwood. This is all live tissue, and this is usually what seals over the wound when you make a pruning cut. 50, 60 plus years ago, this is the type of cut that we used to make. Um, we saw that it used to produce this wound wood right here, and we thought that was a good thing because we thought trees healed. Now we know trees don't heal. Their wound is always there. Um, they're not like humans. The <coughs> spatial orientation doesn't doesn't go back to its original form. It just seals over and produces this wound wood or callus tissue. So we saw, you know, 50, 100 years ago, we saw that. We thought that was a good thing. We found out it's actually terrible for trees. I mentioned the ram's horn. 
A lot of times when you make that improper flush cut right here, the bark starts to curl in, as I mentioned. It looks like a ram's horn, and it causes internal cracks on the inside of the stem. This is one of the worst cuts you can make for a tree. This right here, this is what you want to see when you make a pruning cut. Goes right around the perimeter. This is probably sapwood right here. You want that circle going fully around. So after you prune, year or two, go, go and check your pruning cuts that you made. Just to see how, you can see if you did a good job or, or a bad pruning cut. This right here, call this a stub cut. This is another bad cut. It's not as bad as a flush cut, but as you can see, it's after making that cut, this is what a new cut looks like. This was made probably about two years ago. If I made it back at the branch collar right here, this would have, I would have seen some of this wound wood sealing over. Now I just provide an entryway for decay to get inside the stem. So I should have made the cut right here. How much should you prune? Um, there's a rule of thumb that I'm sure many people have heard, never prune more than 25% of a tree in one growing season. That's true, that's a good rule of thumb. However, for mature trees, you don't want to prune that much. You only want to prune roughly 10% of the total buds or foliage. Mature trees, they just don't handle pruning as well. Um, you know, they've succumbed to a lot of injuries throughout their life, they're stressed out, they're forced, they just gotta keep on putting wood. You make another wound, and also it's a mature tree, so you're probably gonna take out a big, big limb when you make a cut. It's gonna be hard for that tree to overcome that, that wound that it's dealing with. And for younger trees, you can actually prune more than 25%. Um, they just take it a lot better. I don't typically recommend in our climate going 50%, but sometimes you can go close to 40%. I wouldn't go any more than 40%. Um, if there's a drought or something like that, I'd do very light pruning. I probably actually wouldn't even prune at all. And if I was doing aggressive pruning, where I was getting close to the 40, 50%, I would water that tree after I did that. Yeah. By young tree, medium age, what are like the year range? It's like under five years or five to ten years? Yeah, that's a good frame for, for young trees. I'd say first roughly five, five to ten years. And then medium age trees, yeah, probably 15, 20. So when should I prune? For structural pruning, you should just prune the tree when it's young. There's, I'm going to list many seasons of when there's, there's been a pros and cons to each season. But even if it's during a bad season, it's better to prune the tree when it's young than not prune it at all. So as I mentioned, dead, design, dead dying disease, broken limbs, prune that any time of the year. A lot of times that's the type of pruning you're doing to mature trees without stressing the tree out. During the fall, um, there's some issues with pruning during the fall. There's some species out there like maple where when you prune during this time, they'll actually re-sprout again. And if you get an early frost, you're gonna end up killing those sprouts because they're weak. So the tree just devoted all that energy to make new sprouts and then they just died from a frost. So that's why sometimes pruning in the fall isn't the best time. When trees are dormant, I would say most of the professionals say this is typically the best time to prune because there's less uh, decay or pathogens to enter the tree at this time. It's also if there's the Dutch elm disease in the area, which we have, a lot of our elms get Dutch elm disease, you certainly want to prune those during the dormant season so that the pathogen doesn't spread. Um, some issues with this is, like we just experienced, they said the best time to prune right before the bud swell. Well, the buds were swelling about two weeks ago and it was 60 degrees out and then we just got a cold spell. So that did some damage to the, to the buds. And if I made a pruning cut and sap started leaking and then it froze again, you could get a frost crack or uh, just an internal crack right where that pruning cut was made. So there are some limitations of pruning during the dormant season in our region. But, so as you can see right here, this is during the winter, this is a sugar maple on my property, and I made a removal cut, which is the smaller cut at the junction, right at the branch collar. Um, one other good thing about pruning during the dormant season, it's a lot easier to see where to make the proper cuts. When you have a lot of foliage on the tree, it's hard to kind of figure out um, where the branch collar is, you know, where's the closest lateral. So you also have less debris to remove once you do the pruning cuts as well when you prune during the dormant season. During the growing season, I will say this is the worst time that you can prune. Um, the trees devoted all of its energy for new shoots, new roots, flowers, fruit. 
Um, it's devoted a lot of energy, and then if you prune when the buds are swelling or the leaves are coming out, you're just gonna stress the tree out. All those resources it used to develop those shoots are gone. And it's gonna have to re-sprout and it will stress it out. I personally think this is the worst time to prune because the juices are, are flowing, all the sap's flowing on the inside, and you're much more likely to get tearing down the stem when you make a pruning cut. And you get a large wound. So if you do prune during this time of the year, definitely do the three-step method cut. Um, but if your objective is, I want to reduce growth to the tree for whatever reason, then yeah, this is the best time to, this is the best time to prune. So it depends on what your objective is. This is just a three-step cut method again. And as I mentioned with the chainsaw, if I was using a chainsaw, I'd want to make the cut right on top of this because that curve will pinch. Midsummer, mid to late summer, this is actually a really good time to prune as well, um, just like the dormant season. This is right after the leaves have fully hardened off, turned fully green. Um, there's been some studies in Europe that were done and it showed that there was less decay when you prune during this time, right after the leaves have fully hardened. So this is another good time to prune. One issue with it, you're gonna have a lot more leaves and debris. Um, you're also gonna have some leaves hanging down, weighing down the branches, so you could tear some of the bark when you cut down. So once again, use the three-step method cut. Um, whoops. So tools. These are some tools that you're gonna need to structurally prune. Um, we got a pole saw right up here. This is a Silky. Um, I get Silky Hayachi, I believe it is. I get 21 feet with this one, and I'm not promoting Silky. There's Corona, there's Jameson, there's, there's a lot of other good saws out there. That's just the one I have. I also have a pole pruner. This is good for limbs that are about a little less than an inch, about three quarters of an inch. Um, and the most essential tools, hand pruner, and handsaw right here. This, I love this handsaw because it's very narrow and I can get really close and tight crotches to make my pruning cuts. Um, this is a sheath right here that goes over and covers the, the blade. Um, when you're out pruning, I've done this many times, you will get sawdust in your eyes. So I highly suggest that you wear some protective lenses over your eyes. A lot of times you're cutting, these saws cut on the pull versus the carpenter saw where the cuts on the push. So every time you pull up here, you're getting sawdust right in your eyes. Um, right here is an orchard ladder as well. You can use this if you feel comfortable. Um, if you don't feel comfortable and you need a step ladder, then I'd consider hiring an arborist. Um, surprisingly, there's a lot of injuries that happen with uh, the use of ladders. Okay, structurally pruning. Here's the steps. First thing I do, if I plant a new tree or a middle-aged tree, first thing I'm gonna do is clean the canopy. And I'm going to take out any dead, diseased, dying limbs. My next step is to choose and develop a dominant leader. When you do this, it can be, you typically want to take the biggest lead um, that you can find that's free of any defects, any cracks, any rot, any included bark. Um, typically, it's a central leader in the middle. It doesn't have to be. Um, if there's a, you know, if that central leader has a defect, then I would pick another leader to choose. The next step is you want to select and establish your lowest permanent scaffold limb. And all that is is your lowest large limb that you have on the bottom. And it depends. A lot of times if you plant a new tree, that lowest scaffold limb isn't even going to be there yet. Because typically, usually that lowest permanent scaffold limb is about 10 feet off the ground. Um, you want to pick it. Say if you're mowing, you want to pick it at a certain distance. And when you mow around the tree, you don't hit your head. Um, a lot of times in roads, it's typically you keep 15 feet of vertical clearance. So 15 feet is where you want to pick out your lowest permanent scaffold limb. And the last step that you want to do is you establish the other scaffold limbs um, by reducing other nearby branches. And all these scaffold limbs are just the large limbs that you want to keep on the tree that are along the trunk. And you want to space them as well. But that, that Step number four doesn't usually occur in trees when you're doing structurally pruning until about 10 to 20 years after the tree's in the ground. Um, for smaller growing trees, the spacing that you want for the scaffold limb is about um, six to 12 inches. For large growing or medium growing trees, you want about one to two feet. You want all these right here. These are scaffold limbs. So one to two feet for medium age trees. Um, very much. Yep. 
And the reason why you want that is because like that calorie pair that I showed, when you get all branches coming from one point, that trunk tissue cannot overlap that tissue. So it makes a weak connection. You space them out and you get the branch tissue overlapping the trunk, the trunk tissue overlapping the branch tissue, and you get that post and dowel connection that's very strong. Um, but as you can see here, so say this could be my lowest permanent scaffolding because I have a sidewalk. So that's the one I'm picking. But during this process, you might get small limbs growing out here. We call those temporary branches. And some people used to prune them out, but you actually want to keep them. But you want to make sure you keep them half the diameter of the trunk. Um, and how you do that is you make reduction cuts. But the reason why you keep them there is because they increase the taper of the, the trunk. What they do is they just, they have leaves, they provide carbohydrates to the tree. So that's how you increase the taper. The final product that we are looking to create in the open landscape is basically, it's a hybrid between the tree in the forest and the other open landscape trees that we saw that have many branches. Right here, central leader, um, smaller branches attached to the trunk. Now I will say that this is a white fir. These typically just grow this way. Conifers have been around much longer than hardwood, so they've kind of evolved to deal with the winds, and they've kind of found out growing this way is the best. Um, but right here, this is an ash tree. This is the form you want to see when the trees mature. You have one central trunk, and all these limbs coming off are much smaller than half the diameter of the trunk. So you get that very strong connection. And all the trees, all the limbs are relatively evenly spaced on there. So that's the form that we strive for. Okay, now let's go and structurally prune a tree. So, what issues do you see here and how would you prune this tree? <laughs> Basal prune? You actually, you wouldn't, you would not prune this tree because there's conductors right there. Our ANSI standards, the American National Standards Institute, state that you have to be 10 feet if you're not qualified to work around the wires. You have to keep 10 feet from those conductors. Um, that's any limb, that's any tool, that's anything. If you see this and you want any pruning done, you want the tree removed, you should contact an arborist that's qualified to work around conductors. Power yep, power company too. You can come. They'll, they'll, a lot of times they have vendor arborists that will come out and look at this. Um, and you know, some people see this as a service drop here, secondary wire. Typically, only 240 volts go through here. However, if you have a tree down the line on the primary, this could become energized and actually increase in voltage and go up to the primary voltage. So if you see this, just don't. Don't even deal with it. And right here, this is the minimum approach distance table that the ANSI standards provide. Anything less than 50 kV, if you're not a qualified arborist to work around the conductors, you have to keep 10 feet away. Okay, so now we're going to structurally prune a tree. This is a medium age, young to medium age tree. This is a butternut. So the first thing I want to do, what's the first thing I want to do when I structurally prune? I want to clean the crown, and that's removing any dead, disease, some rubbing branches that I see. So right here, I don't know if these, these could have broke due to nature, but there's a little dead stub, dead stub, and right here we have rubbing branches. So those are the first thing that I want to remove before I start going through the other steps of structurally pruning. What limb, if you see rubbing branches like this, what limb would you folks take out first? The one on the bottom or the one at, on the top? The bottom one? So the one you'd actually want to take out is the one on the top. Because the one on the, the, one on the bottom it's almost like a muscle. It's been whole, it developed reaction wood and it's been holding that branch up. The one at the top has just been resting on this, so there's no reaction wood. It's not as strong having that rested up. So that's why I'd want to take off that top one. So my next step, I want to pick a central leader. Typically, as I mentioned, this is the biggest leader. I know this is hard to see. It's right here. Um, it's a central leader. It's not the biggest one, but for this demonstration, this is the one that I want to choose. If there was some defects in here, some cracks, I could have chosen any one of these that I wanted. Um, but I chose the one in the middle. So my next step, you can see there's all, these are my pruning cuts. This is how much I'd prune. I want to take out all the limbs that are competing with this main leader right here. These are all reduction cuts. 
because I'm going back to a lateral that's either the same diameter or I'm removing the larger one. And when I do this, when I take out these cuts here, I'm slowing the growth of this stem. So making this, you see there's two leads here, make the cut here, this stem right here is going to slow in growth and this stem is going to increase in growth. You're taking off some of the leaves so there's less photosynthesis happening and you're also increasing sunlight now for this lead so this one's going to grow more. So that's four, four reduction cuts right there and that's all I would do in one growing season and then I would wait a couple years to do more pruning cuts. I shouldn't have picked yellow but green didn't work and this was the most visible. There's two cuts right here if you can see them. One here and one right here. That's in two to three years. Those are probably the next limbs I take out. And during this time, I'd also, I constantly want to look right here and establish just one leader. I almost make like an inverted a cone right here and any small limb that's competing with that one in the middle, I want to prune. This is the cone I'm talking about. Whenever I go up structurally pruning, I just want to envision that in my head. I don't, I just want one there. So here's the cuts. So the next step, now that I want, I need to pick my lowest permanent scaffold limb. So this is the one that I chose. It's about six, six to eight feet. You can mow around it. Um, it's perfect height. I, it's not along the street, so it doesn't have to be any higher. If this was along the street, you can't see it now, but the tree grew, I'd probably want my permanent scaffold limb up here. And these would all be temporary branches that I would plan on removing at some time. So the next limb I'd want to pick, my next scaffold limb, it's about one to two feet up, right here. My next one right here, my next one right here. And each year I just want to go back and check which limbs are competing with that main central leader and then reduce them in size. It's a, you should try this, just if you go out in the woods and you've got a small little sapling and you've got two limbs, two stems coming up, try removing or reducing one and go back two years later, you'll see that this one, this, this main lead's about double, double in size compared to this one. So here's some before and after pictures of a structurally pruned tree. This is that shielding. This one, this picture, this is from Google Street View. So this, I think this was done 2015. I went out and I pruned that same tree during the winter this past year. So I made one reduction cut here, one reduction cut here, and you can see, it's kind of hard to see, but difference in structure. I should have, there's two up here where I should have took out one, but it was cold, it was getting dark, and uh, I didn't want to get a ladder, so I didn't do it. <laughs> Here's another before and after picture here. Just two removal cuts now. Went back to the trunk. One right here, one right here. That's it. That's all it takes. You don't have to be an arborist to go out and do this. You just need a hand pruner, or if you don't want to do it, you have an arborist come look at your property, you know this is how you want the tree to be, be pruned. So some of the benefits achieved that we achieved with structurally pruning tree can improve the future health of the tree. These limbs are less likely to fail and rip down the trunk. So that's always good if you don't have a large wound on the trunk so you could increase the health of the tree. Certainly reduce future maintenance costs. You saw the trees that I showed earlier, all those big leads coming down. Um, Allows for easier management of shape and size in the future. Um, increase the longevity of the tree. Now, that being said, I've seen trees during major wind storms with perfect structure, no decay whatsoever come down in the wind. When you have enough force that exceeds the strength of the tree, anything could come down. So, it will reduce some of these failures, but it's not going to prevent all. Could be aesthetics. Me personally, I love seeing that hybrid between the force the tree that grew in the forest setting versus the landscape setting. So that all depends, subjective, that depends on you. And lastly, just most importantly, mitigating the risk. So, if you just made this one cut right here, this could have been prevented. It's that easy. So anyways, that's all I have. If you have any questions, uh, fire away. Very helpful. Well, thank you. I should have mentioned that, you're right. If um, So when I'm pruning apple trees, you can get a fungal pathogen called fire blight. When I see that, yeah, you do wanna, you wanna clean and sterilize all your tools. Um, textbook is, it's like one part bleach or alcohol and nine parts water. I, I just use Lysol. 
I don't, I don't know any arborist that goes out and just measures, you know, that out in the field. So Lysol works perfectly. It doesn't rust your equipment either. A lot of times alcohol will create rust. So that's a good question. I forgot to add that in there. So yeah, I try to sterilize as much as possible, especially with hemlock woolly delgin and all these pathogens out there. So yeah, no, that's a good question. Yep. Okay, so we have two old birch trees that are just huge. Yeah. Are they white birches or? Yes. Okay. They make me nervous. Yeah. They're really, in you know, we're in a neighborhood, and I did have an arborist, but he would only cut it down so much. I wanted it lower. Okay. So I just had to do it. Mm -hmm. Nerves, how tall they are. They yeah, and that's one thing. Um, before reduction pruning wasn't considered, we didn't really understand the mechanical stresses that trees have. Like biologically, making those re removal cuts are better for the tree, but mechanically, you're accomplishing a lot less. When you reduce a tree, um, you know there's a force from the ground, the reaction force, and there's a force up at the top of the tree from the wind, and you get a lever between those. So when you reduce the height of the tree, you're decreasing that lever, which is good. You're decreasing the, the bending force in the tree. So that's what you're accomplishing when you're reducing a tree. The biggest thing though is just go back to a lateral that's a third, at least a third the diameter. With birch, the white birch, if he's making those cuts and reducing the size, I try my best to go about to a lateral that's about half the diameter of the stem being removed. But yeah, white birch are just, they're beautiful trees, they're just weak wooded. But Everyone thinks birch is weak. Black birch out there and yellow birch is actually extremely strong. Just gray and white birches, they're, they're just weak wooded. So. In the storm that we had Thanksgiving so many years ago, yeah. some just, just broke. Oh, yeah. You know, went down. I went out and cut it. Yep. Great. And he said, that's going to die. It's just a matter of time. Well, it hasn't died yet. It, it put out a lot of small sprouts. Yeah. Yeah. Great. It's manageable. Whereas this other one is so, I, I don't know, I just don't like it that tall yep. in the neighborhood that, that we live in. Mm -hmm. I just feel like it's just out there by itself. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, if you're concerned, I mean, you could certainly, you could remove the tree entirely as well and plant something, you know, different. Something that, you know, a smaller growing tree, that, that's certainly one option as well. But um, if it has, a lot of times with like a mature tree like this, at this point, this is so hard to correct. So what else you can do is, if it had two co-dominant stems, you could put a cable between here, which will reduce some of the swaying and back and forth. So that's, that's another option that arborists provide. But when a storm is bowed the birch over, can you straighten those? I, uh, a lot of times they'll go back, but I, me personally, I haven't. Um, I've yeah. When you're cutting, uh, AJ is great. He, he teaches a chainsaw safety class, and we just kind of went over that. It's called a, like a lot of times it will be a spring pull. So they're, they're actually very dangerous to cut because they have so much tension on that back side where you have to make some small cuts on the back, like several of them. But I'm, I would be interested to try maybe with the winch to pull it up. I mean, what's the worst that's going to happen? It either if it's still bent over and then you got to cut it down or it's straight up again. But I, I have seen them actually start to go back up during the... Come up a, a little, but not, yeah, not fully. Not yeah. Clear Sometimes those trees that bend, like a lot of trees that grow, depends on how you look at AJ says away from the shade or towards the sun, um, they'll develop. A lot of times people are concerned about leaning trees. If that tree's been leaning for a while, it will actually produce reaction wood on the back side. It's actually, that wood is actually stronger than a straight tree. But yeah, it could uproot as well. So, yep. Okay. Near the street, in, near the city streets, right? And some of the, one of the branches is hanging over wires. It actually is almost going across the street to the other side, and it's over the wire. You know, yeah. So is it the city's responsibility to do the tree, or is it the homeowner? The homeowner owns to the center of the road okay. in New Hampshire. It depends, unless. Um, you know, in some newly developed neighborhoods, sometimes the city, and every city is different, they'll acquire that right of way, but usually it's the homeowner owns to the center of the road in New Hampshire. I know it's different in other states. But, you know, if that's certain, whoever you're, if it's a utility or, um, like, I don't know who's your... Utility wires that aren't coming into the hub. It's a, oh, so it's actually, yeah, primary it's wire? On the street. Okay. It's running on poles, you know? Yeah, um, I would... It's con not even our tree, it's our neighbor's tree. Okay, yeah. But it's huge. We measured the circumference. Yep. Up, and it's 16 feet. Wow. Oh, wow. 
There's a there's a big maybe yeah the New Hampshire Big Tree program. Yeah, um, I wonder if they. Oh, I know I just joined recently, like a week ago or two weeks ago, and I know they were planning to go up and measure a lot of trees because a lot of trees we haven't yeah. measured yet, but um, I'll have to ask, uh, yeah, if you give me the address actually yeah, at the end of this. You can take a look at it. Okay, yeah, no, that's, that's cool. But, but I mean, the, it's a very healthy tree. Yeah. It's got, but it's got, see that the branches there? I mean, it's got like four, it's kind of it's, up, Yeah. Maybe, and then it just kind of branches out. Yeah. It's probably a silver maple. It is, I think. Yeah, it is, yeah. it's um, it's it's tough in that situation. I mean, I've silver maple is weak wooded. There's a beautiful one in Vermont. Um, I live in I live on the western part of the street next to Keene, so I spent a lot of time in Brattleboro. But they have the state record over there. Yep. Same silver maple, huge tons of leads, but I think it's gonna fail at some point. You know, yeah. Oh. We'll yeah. No, I'll, I'll have to get the address and check it out. I know we're going, I think in um, sometime in the, uh, probably during the summer, I think we're going to do some more remeasurement. So maybe I can uh, inform whoever's on, this is Merrimack County, that there's a certain crew. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> One thing we would have to do is we do have to get permission from the, the homeowner to actually go and measure the tree. Yeah. Well, no, we just measured it because it's right, next, right on our property line. So oh. Yeah, so there's dual ownership there. Okay, yeah, we, we would have to go and talk to him. But yeah, no, I'll take, I'll look at it. I'll get the address from you after. So yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you redefine the scaffold I'm not sure Yeah, I know. I, and I went through it quickly. Let me go back to uh, this slide. Okay, it's a little further back, huh? Right here. All a scaffold limb is... It's a limb that you want to keep on the tree for its entire longevity. It's just, it's just one of the large limbs that you see in trees. That's, that's all a scaffold limb is. Um, and you just want it, if you want to, when you pick out a scaffold limb, so you don't want to prune it. Well, actually, I guess you, sometimes you do want to reduce in size if it starts becoming larger than the main stem. So it, by reducing it, like making a cut right here, it will slow the growth. But you just want it to be free of defects. All scaffold limb is one of the large limbs. That's all it means. OK. We have plenty of handouts out here as well if you guys are interested on tons of stuff. So feel free to grab some. Thank you for coming. Thank you.